I had the opportunity to sit down with one of my favorite authors, Sally Fallon Morrell, who has the Nourishing Tradition books and is the president and founder of the Weston A. Price Foundation. We visited on what she thinks we should be eating and how diets affect pretty much everything. I had been um, collecting this information for years. I mean, it started with writing Nourishing Traditions. Uh, I kept a file. I had a file on Asia and a file on uh, Aborigines, and, and I kept a bunch of books on all these. And I'd always wanted to write this book, and I finally got the opportunity. Um, so th this book was not published by New Trends, but by Grand Central, who did Nourishing Broth, and they did Nourishing Fats. And then they, I proposed, well, let's do nourishing diets. And they haven't been very happy with me because the book didn't really sell very well. But to me, I think it's the best book I've written. I think it's absolutely fascinating. The, uh, it starts with the Aboriginal focus. And I learned more about Australia from your yeah. book than anything else I've ever done. You know, what's interesting to me, the two groups of indigenous peoples that are considered the simplest, right, were the California Indians and the Australian Aborigines. And yet, once we dive in and look at how they managed their landscape and produced food, we see that they were actually probably the wisest and the most advanced of these indigenous people. And remember, they had no metal tools, they had didn't have a wheel, they didn't have anything that we consider important to have, and yet they produce these absolutely gorgeous landscapes. Um, abundance beyond belief. Uh, I, I love the scene in, um, and I do talk about this, the California um, and the chapter on Native Americans about how when the geese flew over in, um, I think it was sort of central California, the sky would be black for an hour. And when they landed, it was they covered an area of about four square miles. It's wild, absolutely wild. The the Aborigines using all the different techniques to cultivate the landscape to be as productive as it was is is something I don't think anybody really knows. Well, people don't realize this. They cultivated grain. In fact, the early settlers described fields that had been um, harvested and the grains were stacked in haystacks. It just, just looked like haystacks. And the grain belt in Australia uh, went from one coast to the other across the desert. Now, they can't grow grain in the desert today, but the Aboriginal people knew how to do this. They knew how to get water to these crops. They knew which kind of seeds would grow in, a, in such a dry environment. And so they made these the deserts very productive. It's and amazing then, what can be done when you're working with nature instead of trying yeah. to dominate it, isn't it? Right. Well, and they, they knew these things almost like intuitively. You know, we learn by science and observing the physical world, but they learned from above. They had this intuition. And then they knew how to prepare the grains, and this is one of... Many examples I cite all over the world, they didn't just grind up the grains and eat them. They soaked the grains often for two weeks and then ground them and made little these little cakes that the first settlers basically lived on because they had nothing else. And uh, the, um, they had these ovens, these really fascinating ovens that slow cook the grains. So uh, there's a beautiful description of an Aboriginal village in the evening where the women are grinding the grains on their grinders and the smoke's coming out of the ovens and the men are, like all men do, you know, they stand around talking and gossiping while the women did the work. But it was just a beautiful scene that was described. And of course, the settlers didn't appreciate this. They destroyed as much as they could. The Aboriginals also had the ingenious system for their rivers to capture fish, but to ensure that enough fish went 
downstream to the next village and the next village and the next village. So it was great cooperation. And these were kind of weirs that trapped the fish and they could scoop them up and then the fish went over to the next village. And all of those were destroyed, almost immediately destroyed by the village, by the uh, settlers. The, Settlers, yes, yes. That's uh, kind of a common theme across history, isn't it? Um, yeah, well, uh, there was no appreciation, and people just thought, well, these people are, um, they called them savages. Dr. Price called them primitives. Right. But uh, they just didn't think they had anything to offer us. And the, um, uh, what was I going to say? They didn't have anything to offer us. And yet, as Dr. Price says, what the primitive people have to teach us is much more important than what the uh, civilized man had to teach them. I think in hindsight, we are seeing that that is extremely true. Uh, what do you think about that disconnect of where you were saying, you know, a spiritual understanding as uh, far as uh, we don't have these multi-generational um, wisdom passed down like we used to. I don't feel. I don't feel like the newer generations spend hardly any time learning the traditions of, you know, our, our grandparents or great grandparents or, or well, and the gra partner. our grandparents had lost them already. So we can't blame them really. Yeah. You know, all of this is it was important for us to lose all of that, to become completely separated from the spiritual world or the super sensible world, whatever you want to call it which is very real to the traditional people. And because we became separated from that and with a lot of incarnations, a lot of suffering, uh, we now have uh, wonderful things. We have the internet, which, you know, it's like a miracle. Uh, we have cameras, we have books, you know, we have knowledge. Um, and so this was all necessary. But now, uh, to me, I think we've kind of accomplished the, the most that this point of view can accomplish. That is an absolutely fascinating way of looking at that. that is and, and so now, now we have to re, um, recapture this ability to also learn from the spiritual world. And somebody very famous put it like this. Be wise as serpents. That's the scientific, you know, um, learning from the physical world. And be gentle as doves. And that's getting your knowledge from the super sensible world. So that is our challenge to uh, balance those two ways of gaining knowledge. And that's what we try to do at the Weston A. Price Foundation. We look for the scientific validation of traditional food ways. And when we can find science that supports this, for example, the practice of soaking grains um, or the practice of fermenting foods or the practice of preferentially eating the animal fat, uh, we find this science that supports this, then we, we kind of know we're on the right track. Yeah. That well, and I think that that no, was... I, I'd sent, you know, I'd, I'd responded back to your email that I, my only regret is that I haven't dove into your work sooner, right? Like <laughs> I, I'm blown away. But going back to your point, sometimes that's that losing something is the best way of, of learning it. That, Absolutely. That Absolutely. So it's uh, all it's all preordained. So it, it is. <laughs> I, I'm just I'm blown away, and I think that's why I, I, it really hit me when you said said what you did. The my journey of learning started because my son was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And so that is where I was like, how do we figure this out? Right. And so I've gone everything from the China study is where I really started. Got into your friend, uh, Dr. Tom Cowan, thought that his work was really early on and just kind of gone full circle to where, you know, the vegetarian vegan way. This is how we heal uh, all that all the way to the other extreme of carnivores working for people. Why? Why is that? And so going through all those different aspects have caused me to question everything, really. Well, and, which you should. Which you should. And your work has, you and Jordan Rubin, honestly, have connected more of those those different dots than, than anybody. And I, I just, I appreciate it so much. 
so my point with all that, what what is our best first steps of, of gaining the applicable applicable things to get started down the right track? For for somebody that's not aware that, you know, you've been you're one of the, the originals in this movement by by far. What do we do to start getting more awareness and, and on the right track? Yeah. And just before I answer that question, I think you're talking about these extreme diets, vegan, vegetarian, and paleo, uh, carnivore. And our diet is not like that. The traditional diets were not like that. They had plant foods and animal foods and seafood, and they had everything. They ate everything. And I think that's good news for most people to eat a healthy diet. It doesn't have to be a weird diet that separates you from your fellows, you know, so. So I, we always say the first thing is to get your fats right, F-A-T-S. Because what the number one thing that's killing us is the industrial seed oils, uh, which were not in our diet until the early 1900s. They are very toxic. Uh, they cause cancer, they cause heart disease, they cause growth problems in children. They cause pregnancy problems. They cause birth defects. They cause everything. They're highly toxic and they're in all processed food. And if you're cooking in vegetable oils, they're in even home cooked food. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. And you, what you need have to realize is that everything you've been told about fats and oils is wrong and that the healthy fats are the saturated animal fats. So that means you use butter, not margarines and spreads. So that means you cook in lard, good old fashioned vitamin D rich lard. Lard has a lot of vitamin D in it. Um, or tallow, uh, which is beef fat. You can have fried foods on our diet, but you have to use the right fats, see? Um, poultry fats we're finding are extremely valuable in the diet. That's why you want to eat the skin on the chicken. And then for your salad dressing, you want to use real olive oil. And again, you have to be very careful because most olive oil is not real. It's vegetable oil or partly vegetable oil. So does your olive oil get thick when you put it into the refrigerator? Then it's real. So, and, and we are, the first thing, if, you're, if you've never cooked before, the first thing is to make your salad dressing because the salad dressings that you buy are made with cheap oils, mostly soybean oil, and the list of ingredients is very long and lots of flavorings and everything. And one more thing about these industrial oils, 80% of the oil that we use in this country is soybean oil. And one tablespoon of soybean oil contains as much estrogen as a birth control pill. Yeah, that's jaw jumping. So if you, if your kid eats uh, chicken nuggets and French fries and a pastry, he's getting the equ equivalent of at least three birth control pills. You don't want to do that to your child. It's not a question of, um, oh, maybe this isn't good for him. It's a question of your children are in danger when you let them eat this way. They are in danger. You have have through me researching your work a huge emphasis on on the uh, you know the growth and children pregnancy and all of that and so that has been really eye opening. I think the vegetable oils you have done an amazing job of laying out why they are so horrible and so getting the fats right that that's what you feel is like right. that first step and and the second step I would say is one way or another and this is hard. The fats part is kind of easy, but this is hard. Eat some liver once or twice a week. Eat some liver, whether it's beef liver, calves liver, whether you make pate with chicken liver, uh, whether it's chopped liver, or if you can't do any of that, it's, um, you know, take a desiccated liver. Um, your children need to be on cod liver oil. Um, for the vitamins A and D. But the healthiest people I know were the people who grew up eating liver regularly. I, th I mean, that seems evident. What would what do you say to this kind of new movement uh, attacking vitamin A? I don't know if you've seen that. Oh, it's right not there. new. 
It's been around a long time. Uh, vitamin A is toxic. The vitamin A causes birth defects. And we have um, written quite a bit about this. I think it started in a study that was published in uh, 1995. I'm, I may be wrong about that date. But anyway, where they said that taking vitamin A during pregnancy causes birth defects. Well, it was a they weren't taking vitamin A in pregnancy. They were taking, they were eating processed food that had synthetic vitamin A in it. They were not getting their vitamin A from liver or cod liver oil. And um, th there were certain types of birth defects that were higher, but there were other types of birth defects that were lower. And it was a food recall study. I mean, it was just, just junk. It's really junk science. And we had, there were two previous studies showing that uh, consumption of um, vitamin A rich foods was associated with lower birth defects. So I actually just wrote a, um, an article on this for the Epic Times and I've written a lot about it, but um, yeah, it's just a shame. And uh, up until this time when they started demonizing vitamin A, the recommendation for pregnant women was 25,000 units a day. And then they, they actually took vitamin A out of the prenatal pills. And I'm not a fan of prenatals, but I think it actually did some good. And started putting carotenes in, beta carotene, and that has some very negative effects. Uh, it's funny, they're just sneaking a little bit of vitamin, real vitamin A back into the prenatals now, because I think they realized what a terrible mistake this was. Yeah, I, on the the synthetic vitamins, um, I have found through the, the whole thing with cancer and my son that uh, we have the MTHFR gene variation, and that the folic acid actually gives us a whole lot of problems versus you know natural folate, and that That's is interesting. That yeah. that uh, uh, Dr. Ben Lynch has put out some incredible work in regards to the, the gene variations mm -hmm. and the folic acid as a synthetic is, is, is awful. Um, it well, absolutely terrible. It down. <laughs> yeah, down. It's, it's something worth, worth noting. And I've been trying to, you know, scream from the rooftops on, on how important that is in your work on the, the pregnancy, uh, that that's, it's in all of them. So folic acid is like dirt cheap versus folate. And they keep putting that in there. Um, right. And the folic acid is in baby formula. It's in the prenatals. It's in, uh, it's in, you know, processed foods. The other thing we're very concerned about, and this is very uh, timely right now, is taking vitamin D supplements. Um, because what we have pointed, and with COVID, you know, people are taking 10,000 units of vitamin D, and that's way beyond what we need, for one thing. And secondly, it depletes vitamin A and vitamin K. And you need these three vitamins together. We call that the vitamin triangle. And so you need A and D to activate the vitamin K, and vitamin K activates the vitamin K-dependent proteins. Um, so you need to get these things from food, and taking a lot of vitamin D is a sure way of completely depleting your vitamin A and K, and that's why taking vitamin D is associated with kidney stones and calcification of the arteries and things like this. I'll tell you a story. My daughter-in-law, my daughter-in-law-to-be, was taking 10,000 units of D on the doctor's recommendation and to get her vitamin D levels up. And it didn't do any good. And when I found out, <laughs> just, I almost hit the ceiling. I said, oh, you, you can't do that. Take this cod liver oil, take the capsules. And uh, about a month later, she said, guess what? <laughs> my vitamin D, I stopped taking the D. I started taking the cod liver oil and my vitamin D levels have gone up. So <laughs> we, the fact that the doctors are prescribing vitamin D and never, ever even mention vitamin K is mind blowing. Much, well, much now, like, you know, but the thing is, they got, they sort of getting it. We, we have done a lot on vitamin K and we have brought vitamin K to the public eye. So now they are prescribing vitamin D and vitamin K. Well, the vitamin K they're prescribing is not the kind of vitamin K that you need. You need MK4 and they're prescribing MK7 which is made by fermentation. It's not very effective. And the two of these together is your recipe for completely depleting your body of vitamin A. Yeah. 
So it's like nothing works in isolation. Like two steps forward and three steps backwards. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's I think that's why I enjoyed the nourishing diet so much is that you laid out what what we you know, what we were doing, what our ancestors were doing, whether, and, and you did it across the world. I think that is what blew my mind on and how well you did it. Uh, well, it's really fascinating. We have these 11 principles that we call them and the diets are all different. In one diet is fish and oats. And then in the South Seas, you have fish, pig, and tubers. And then in Switzerland, you have raw milk and grains, you know, so the diets are all different, but the 11 principles are the same everywhere in the world. I, I love that because I have found it very difficult to get an accurate um, understanding of what my ancestral diets would have been. Mm -hmm. A lot of Europe, uh, Scottish, Irish, yes, and, right. then, and then the Native American is a little bit in there. And so like, that's where I have tried to learn a lot of just knowing what, you know, my literal ancestors were eating. And, and by far, your book is the best resource that I have found on that. Um, yeah, if you were had any Scottish ancestry, you ate oats. And I, I love to interview elder people about what they ate. And when I interview Southerners, they either ate grits or oats, okay? And the ones who ate oats were very insistent that we did not eat grits. We ate oats. <laughs> so there was some kind of uh, class thing or something going on, you know, with, with the oats and the grits. Yeah. How funny. That's, that's interesting. What, what do you think from the perspective? And this is another thing that like, I have enjoyed so much reading your stuff and learning about you. You actually have a farm. You have a store that you sell local and regenerative foods and you do all the education. I don't know how you do all of it. I fell every day trying to do do the same because we have a we have a market. We don't actually have a farm, but we have amazing partners in farming. Yeah. How where how are you located? We, You're located Arkansas, in Arkansas, Central Arkansas. Oh. Um, and you know we've we've got a, an amazing following and and just the story behind cancer, the wellness that you know that motivates us uh, a lot. What? What can we do to help build that local system? Because I think that we have people all over the world, all over the country that are doing something. But sometimes I find that it's more like these islands that are working independent. And we don't have a sure enough system uh, in place, a local food system, and to make it all come together, right? Like we have these pieces all over the place, but we don't have the full system. That's what we're actively trying to build out. And why I have, you know, I've joined the Weston A. Price Foundation now. I did that yesterday. As <laughs> just, I, I'm really excited what y'all are doing. And I'm going to sing y'all's praises. What do we do with your experience of having so many pieces of the food system under your belt and experience to, to get this in more places, the full system? Well, it's, it's, it's certainly developing all over the country. And I think the um, motivator, number one motivator is raw milk. So... We uh, are a dairy farm and we are allowed to produce raw cheese for human consumption. We're in the state of Maryland, but I was able to get a permit for raw milk. Um, I, excuse me. I was able to get a permit for raw milk sold as pet, pet food. And you can do this in any state and we'll help you do it. And you can sell pet milk in stores. The only rule is it has to be in a separate fridge with that, away from the human food, right? <laughs> and um, when we open on Thursday morning, there's a line of people to get the pet milk. In fact, we cannot produce enough pet milk right now. And this is what I hear from raw milk producers all over the country, that the demand is skyrocketing. And this is the quintessential local food that again has been demonized for years and is a, a great food to get in your diet to get your health back. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, one day a, a local man came in and I knew, knew him. I, he owns the lumber yard, okay? And he has daughters and grandchildren and big, very big in the community, but I'm sure they kind of grew up on fast food. I mean, just no, no sign that there was any interest in food. And I mean, they never asked us any questions about the farm and, and we're friends. Uh, so he comes in and he buys two 
bottles, half gallons of raw milk. Now, I probably shouldn't be telling this because, but anyway, he said his grandson had gotten very ill, would only eat one food, macaroni and cheese. And of course, there are so many addiction agents in these uh, processed foods that make the children addict, addicted to these foods. And he was losing weight and very unhealthy and they were so concerned. He said, we're gonna try this. So the boy, um, I mean, he's not out of the woods yet, but he gained weight, gained his weight back, more lively, feels better. He's still addicted to macaroni and cheese. <laughs> but um, so I, I always say um, for moms, you know, it, it is such a burden on parents, but especially the moms. There's so many temptations out there. Um, maybe the rest of the family is not with her at all. And she's trying to give her children a healthy diet. The one thing she can do, besides getting her fats right, is give her children raw milk because it's a complete food. Non-allergenic, prevents asthma, prevents respiratory illness, prevents rashes, gives them wonderful strong bones, helps them to concentrate, do better in school. And so, you know, and it's easy. You don't have to cook it. <laughs> you just pour it into a glass and the children like it. It tastes delicious. The convenience aspect is, I mean, it it's is very, it's very challenging. Yes. Yeah. So, um, um, that, what are your thoughts, Sally, then on the, like the A, the A2 versus A1? Well, I, I'm not sure. Um, I personally, I think that's probably these tests come out are really an indication of what the cows are being fed. Uh, our milk tests A2, we didn't choose A2 cows, it just, but they're all pasture fed. So, um, but it's very easy to test for it. Uh, and, um, it, you know, it, it may be a factor that helps them um, tolerate milk, you know, raw milk. Yeah. What, what's next? What's after we get those nutrients? Because I, I truly believe looking you know, through the lenses that, that I have over the years is that all of our problems essentially, uh, essentially are uh, due to toxicity or deficiency. Uh, yeah, a, a combination well, of we say there's three causes of disease, toxins, nutrient deficiencies, or um, uh, injuries like birth injuries or whatever that, that can cause disease too. But toxins. Okay. So where are the toxins? They're in our water fluoride. They're in our air. Now we have a certain ability to deal with toxins, even dioxins. Uh, and that comes from vitamin A. Vitamin A is our big protection against toxins. But the number one source of toxins and horrible poisons for our children are vaccinations, which are loaded with aluminum. This aluminum is injected into the tissues. So you're bypassing the gut where you have a kind of barrier and a protection against uh, absorbing these toxic metals. And the aluminum has an affinity for the brain tissue. Um, I mean, we couldn't think of a worse way to slowly poison our children. Yeah, so I've never actually publicly said this before, but my oldest who had ended up with stage four cancer, he we have a reported by the pediatrician vaccine injury. So this isn't, I, I don't get to be the crazy conspiracy theorist that's saying vaccines caused anything. Like it happened. So what happened with, with him was that he got, uh, he got vaccines and it was like, you know, a whole cluster of them at one whack. Uh, within a day, his uh, poop was chalk white. So it completely shut off the bile to his liver. Right. And so what does bile do when you start talking about the, the fat soluble vitamins and everything? It, it just completely wrecked something. So took him back in. Uh, you know, our pediatrician turned it in as a vaccine injury. Um, and so, uh, you know, we had it documented. So that was my first eye opening that like, my goodness. And so, of course, their solution at the time was, well, we just won't give them all at the same time. We'll break it up. I hadn't gone down the rabbit trail yet. Uh, and so, you know, and then that's what we did. And so, like, I, I'm not happy uh, about it, honestly. And, and I don't want to ostracize people by being open uh, about it. But at some point, there, there's a tipping point, right? Like, we, we either be quiet, accept stuff, or we say, 
this is not right and let's question it and, and do something about it. So, um, yeah, no, because of that and the, the significant, I, I'm not just on Google research and stuff, right? Like I'm, I, it's, it's hardcore research that it's not what other people say when they say research. I know unequivocally that the vaccine played a part, but I also know that it destroyed his ability to detoxify things because of the MTHFR gene mutation, the excessive formula, folic acid. Uh, he, he had the reflux, right? The, so we did the rice cereal. Um, we, we, he, he was just exposed to all kinds of toxins on top of the vaccine and we didn't feed him right. Uh, and it manifested the way it did. So, Again, that's my motivation. I don't want anybody to go through this. He's doing great. You know, he's a third year, third grade, nine-year-old little boy running around. He's got one kidney less, but we're, we're trucking along. And, and that's why this is so important. And your work has spoken to my soul. <laughs> well, um, my kids weren't vaccinated. And when they were growing up, I kept my mouth shut because I didn't want it to rebound on them. But I certainly told them, I told them, you know, we had a child in the neighborhood who had severe epilepsy and they witnessed seizures and that's a terrible thing to witness. And I always told them because the mother had told me this half started to happen after a vaccination. And I always told them that. And I said, when you grow up and you have this decision to vaccinate your children, remember, let's call him Johnny and, uh, and what the vaccination did to him. And you don't want that to d happen to your children. So Bless their souls. I have unvaccinated grandchildren, um, but it, this uh, issue of vaccination, especially now with the COVID vaccination, whereas you, if you didn't get this vaccination, you were endangering people. That's what they said. It has torn families apart. It's torn uh, couples apart, it's torn communities apart. Um, that was one of the purposes of this, I think. And, um, you know, it's now coming out that the people who didn't get the COVID vaccine were right um, and who protected their children from this were right. And it's just, you know, these people are not going to apologize, but it's kind of leaking out in the New York Times. Yesterday was an article by someone who'd been really pushing these vaccines. And she kind of stepped back from him and said, I, I don't think you should uh, get the booster. So um, it's been. I a think that it's, it's it's been a time of awakening, right? Oh, like, my goodness. We're it's sick. opened so many people's eyes to yeah. what's going on. Yeah. And some Which, people pushing these vaccines are just ignorant or frightened. But there are people who know exactly what they're doing. And, and I think that this is why what you said at the very, very beginning of, you know, the, it was necessary for us to lose s some of that knowledge in order to, to wake up. And yes. I think yes. this is a parallel to what you were saying mm -hmm. uh, on that. Yeah. Uh, and so, again, this is where we go back. Hey, what is our solution? What do we do? How do we build out this local, regenerative, oh. sustainable food system? Because we're, we're going to do it. We're going to learn how to do it. We're going to do yeah. it. And we're gonna teach yeah, we will do it that. because what's happening is what I call the natural selection of the wise and the people who are wise and eat local pasture fed food and nutrient dense food and don't vaccinate their children. They'll have grandchildren and great grandchildren. The others won't because these Vaccines and these foods are anti-fertility uh, agents. They're, um, Do you think that many know how big of an issue that is, that our fertility rate is tanked and it's going down? Well, it's actually been in the news, So, but they're not saying why. They're not saying that, you know, soybean oil, which is in all 80% of processed food, is... Uh, um, feminizing your boys and possibly masculinizing your girls. Um, so what we have at the Weston A. Price Foundation, we call it the 50% campaign. And that is spend 50% of your food budget on local naturally raised foods and artisan foods, sourdough bread, ferments and everything. Uh, and the other 50%, you can celebrate how small the world has become and enjoy pineapple and rice and mangoes or whatever you want. Okay. So again, it's not extreme. It's not, um, hard, 
but it is actually the only way that we are going to save this our farms and save this country and save our children. I love and, the 50% rule. That seems very simple, straightforward, it's simple, straightforward and, and it's easy and you're spending this money anyway. Yep. So you spend half of it on local food. Yep. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah. So it, uh, what I was going to say was uh, we're not going to change the government. We're not going to change the food industry. We can't pass laws. Laws do no good. The only thing that works is a change in consumer behavior. And the educated consumer is the strongest force on earth. We're stronger than any of these food industries or the uh, vaccination industry. Or We're stronger than they are. So I love that. that. <laughs> I, I love that. And it, Sally, I could visit with you forever, I believe. Um, but, you know, we're, we'll wrap this up. I know you've got stuff to do, but thank you. And, and you know, what is, what is the next thing? Do you have a, uh, your favorite resource? I'm going to encourage everybody, you know, to, to check out Weston A. Price Foundation. And well, our join. conference is coming up. It will be in Kansas City, Missouri. Okay. That's not too far. No. Uh, go to wisetraditions.org. Uh, we are lining up a great um, lineup of speakers. Myself, I, I speak Tom Cowan. Um, we have a speaker on vitamin D. I'm very excited about I've never heard him before, but he warns against the vitamin D supplements and shows what happens when you take the vitamin D supplements. We have a great speaker on vitamin A for fertility who as a dietitian, has helped many women get pregnant, uh, making sure they get enough vitamin A. So it's, um, and we have um, advanced kind of scientific talks, but we also have simple talks. Uh, one talk I'm very excited about is how to make healthy fast food. So food your kids will eat, healthy hamburgers, onion rings, all these good things, healthy soft drinks. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, we really are trying to help families transition to this way of eating so that it's not too hard, not too expensive, but what's the goal? Healthy children. Absolutely. So I, I've got four of them. You know, my oldest is nine, the baby's two. And so the you have an ally in Arkansas and we're, we're oh. going to do everything we can to, to keep this You should be a local chapter. Moment. You should be a local chapter. I, help I think you're right. Sure, yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I have never come across anything that is so spiritually parallel to what I've been after. You just have the groundwork and experience and, and network, honestly, that it, it, this has been an answered prayer, honestly, honest to God. So I've been so excited. Good. Well, hopefully we'll see you there. I will do. I will do my best to be up there. But uh, right. Sally, thank you so much. And, and I will get um, everything sent to you as Yes, as we we'll practice. publicize the interview. And that's great. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. You too. Thank you for listening to the Sewing Prosperity Podcast. We hope that you have learned something new and that you are inspired to adopt regenerative practices in your community. Remember that by working together, we can create a sustainable and abundant future for ourselves and for future generations.